Thank you, fam. I've it's woken a, up with a different Ken Spivey song on my mind every morning. Of she morning. woke up with a different Ken Spivey. That's what I heard. <laughs> I'll just finish the hangover panel. She so just far. makes me dress like Sam Carter so much. Woo it's so weird. <laughs> <laughs> You're so accommodating. Yeah. Yeah, she, she, like, she, 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 she just calls it, she calls it my staff weapon. She tells me to get over it. I know, I know. She's the track director, so if I mock her, it's okay. It's fine. Yeah. Um, my name is Ken Spivey. I, I also, uh, in college, I, I used to teach at the University of South Florida in a previous life. And my two fields were ancient Roman history and gender theory. And I taught one course called uh, Masculinity in Film. And I thought that would be an interesting approach for Stargate to discuss masculinity in Stargate and how it applies to both male and female characters. So uh, we had the romantic panel yesterday. Well, of course, we'll hit upon romantic relationships and relationships in this panel. But we're going to focus primarily on how masculinity and what it means to be a man or a gendered male means in Stargate. Because it is a very masculine show. What is your name, young man? <laughs> My name is Jamie Poff. I'm the assistant track director for Stargate Multiverse. Um, and I really enjoy studying the, the gender basics of, of what, what happens in Stargate especially. Uh, in particular, whenever uh, characters sometimes get pigeonholed or classified as, as you know, not as masculine, for example, Daniel Jackson. I think that sometimes uh, people go too far with classifying him the wrong way. I think that's just a different type of masculinity. So, you know. we'll we'll, def we'll definitely address that. Yeah. And let's go character by character. Mm -hmm. And uh, last night I had the unexpected delight to have supper with Christopher Judge. And uh, there is nothing more classically masculine than that gentleman. Yeah. So, in and the, the more traditional regard, let's discuss very stereotypical, um, historically traditional masculinity. He's a tall, strong, uh, virile man who carries around a really big stick, in case we didn't get the point. <laughs> so, he, let's almost look, you, uh, you know, modern scholars like to view gender as a spectrum. Let's put Teal oh, all the way over here. I guess he would be like the uber man over there. Um, I'm going to address this to the audience. What what views do you what, what comes to mind when you think of the masculinity of Tink? What makes him so masculine? He's protective. He's protective. That's very good. Uh, what was that? Aggressive. Aggressive. Yes. And what else? Honorable. Honorable. And silent. Silent. Yes. Oh, that's silent. A good, that's a good observation. What? I, I'm so glad you answered that way because it's going uh, to what I, I, I was, my theory was that he is the one who actually represents a more traditional, traditional Western ideal of chivalry. He is the knight of the show. He is a gracious, humble, strong man who is silent, who does what he should do for God and country. He protects his friends. His family. His family means a lot. He does things for the sake of honor. Um, please don't take this as a sexist remark, ladies. Uh, a friend of mine from graduate school, I, I have a, a disorder where uh, I enjoy the opposite sex, and it's a mild addiction. And, <laughs> and my friend Jay uh, was, when we were studying together, when you're in academia, a lot of folks, they focus so much on their career, social life is really, it's secondary. You could say tertiary, like if you're a D&D fan, you definitely know what that means. It's the, it's the character uh, skill set that doesn't really matter. He was 32 and he had never been with a woman. And he wanted me very quickly to describe what's the difference between men and women. And please don't take offense to this, ladies, but the, but the best way I could describe it very quickly is that overall, in, at least in my humble Hobbit-esque opinion, thank you, <laughs> men have honor and women have principles. 
men generally hearken back to the knights of old. We throw down a, a, a cloth for a woman, generally. I'm making generalizations, you go like, oh no, there's this one example, like, I get it, yeah, there's an example, exception to every rule, these are generalities. You throw down your cloak for a woman. You, uh, you're strong, you defend your family for honor. Women, on the other hand, the traditional feminine uh, uh, role sets, they changed to the point where we went through three waves of feminism where uh, women were starting to become stronger, then women, it became a more militant feminist movement from the 60s to about 2000, where women were just like, I'm just as good as a man, I'm just as good as a man, and constantly trying to prove themselves. Modern scholars say that we are in a third wave of feminism, which states that women can do whatever. You could be feminine, you could be masculine, you can be gay, you could uh, be straight, it doesn't matter. Anything you do is feminine. So therefore, what makes up the rubrics, the, the rules of a woman's life, are principles, in my opinion, because they are rules they create for themselves, which unfortunately could change at any moment, and if we defy them, we get in trouble. Yep. <laughs> yes, every man in here knows what I'm talking about, and, and, and every woman goes like, that's not true, but it is, but it isn't. Well, that's why I said men have honor, women have principles, mainly due to the philosophical background of the two genders. And going in, uh, in that regard, what's interesting is that um, quite a few of the women on Stargate have honor in, in not arbitrary principles. So who's not dissimilar to Kirk in so many ways is Samantha Carter yeah. has, she does not have principles. She ha actually acts like a chivalrous knight in quite a few ways. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact she gave a giant talk on her, her, she, her being more than her reproductive system early on, <laughs> Let, let's blame that on the writers. Let's not blame that on the character for that episode. She, you could say that she is a beautiful exception to the rule, but I believe that exception allowed her to be accepted by Stargate Command and to work effectively in that workplace. If I can comment on that, yes. I think that if we were to say that as a generalization women have principles, I think Sam Carter's principle is that she is going to have an honor that's similar to what we would classify as masculine. That's actually incredibly brilliant, yes, because she has chosen, it's the arbitrary set of rules that she chose mm -hmm. to choose the, the, the other, um, it's called the totalizing schema, uh, the other totalizing schema. What that means, real quick, did anyone take philosophy in college? There's a scary thing that happens in philosophy. If you accept a general number of rules in a, in a philosophy, if you accept those premises, you're trapped within that totalizing schema. The biggest thing is like of religion. If you accept some of the basic tenets uh, of Christianity, everything has to fall within Christianity or else you leave the totalizing schema. So no matter what you do in life, it falls within the totalizing schema of Christianity. We could say that the honor and principle uh, sets are two totalizing schemas. Since she's still within the totalizing schema of principles, she has chosen to emulate the other totalizing schema while not leaving her own. Does that make sense? If I can give another example from a diff different perspective, I'm a mathematician, and in math we have certain basic axioms that we accept as our foundation. We can add new math and we can talk about new types of numbers. But what we cannot do is create properties and principles that defy what we've already accepted. Precisely. Okay. So what he's talking about with the totalizing schema is that, yeah, okay, now we can have exponents that are fractions. When before we just had an idea about what an exponent was. But an exponent that's a fraction is a new type of number. But all of its properties and principles agree with what we already knew about previous types of exponents we had. Precisely. On our science panel yesterday, uh, one of the things we approached was that science is essentially, it's, just, it's philosophy. It's philosophy that happens to work, and we can make things from it. But whenever you get down to it, essentially you have to believe in that 
science is still a philosophy. It's still an ideology that you can see practical application, not that you cannot with other ideologies. So Samantha Carter, I love that idea that she still uses the basic concept of honor versus principles, but she chose to emulate the honor set. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any problems or, or questions or does this offend anybody? Sometimes when I say this, it offends people and I don't think they're quite understanding what I'm saying because whenever I told them that, it's like I summed up like an entire lifetime of what I know about men and women is that women, if they change their minds and change their rules, they can and be, be ready for them to be angry with you because like I remember one time a young lady said, uh, I never ever go to a concert that costs more than $30. And I said, why? She goes, it's a rule I have. I went, why? It just is. But it meant so much to her, she was screaming angry over it. It didn't make sense to me because it did not defy any bit of honor because if I wanted to see a band that I really like, I'd be willing to pay them $35. But it was an arbitrary rule that she created at that time. On the other hand, if she wanted to scalp a ticket, and, and not pay for the ticket for a band that I truly like, that would not be honorable, and I, I just couldn't do it, even though it would fit within that principle set, because as far removed as we feel we are from the Knights of Old, men generally, we're, we still, if we see a drowning woman in, in, in a river, this has been seen to this day, men will, will not know who the woman is, jump in the river and try to save her. Are you saying Try, women won't? No, I'm not saying that women won't. Because <laughs> I certainly have. You know. <laughs> like I said earlier, there's an exception to every... Uh, all of these are generalizations. So if we, we start running out every exception, uh, the conversation doesn't happen. But it sounds like you're saying that... But what, what I'm saying is that... Other people is something that only men would do. I no, think anyone who saw someone drowning... I think what he's saying is men won't even think about it. It's instinctually hardwired into most of us. Well, women, they'll think about it first and then ask. I disagree. Uh, no, no, that's, no, what I'm saying is that that may, may be, be a principle that she's chosen to live her life by. Okay. And, like, are you saying then that the men don't have the choice? Men don't think uh, first. That's we, that's unfortunately, uh, according to most of the uh, studies, men don't think first with actions like that. They act. And it's more, it's not because we don't think, it's, it's a survival instinct is we immediately fight, we immediately act, we immediately protect. And it's not something that we're born with, it's something that we're taught. And we're taught by our dads, this is what you do, son. And if you're raised without a father, TV tells you that. Yes, you can choose to act against it, but if I chose not to jump in the river about the woman, it would hurt my honor. Let's move away from something that we think everyone will do, but like, Throwing down your cloak. Yes. Back yes. Like, you say that's because of honor and all men have to follow the honor. Are you saying No, they don't, don't have, have to, to, but they tend to. Mm -hmm. But you, you, uh, the way I'm understanding you, you're presenting the honor as something you have to do. Oh, but women have more choices. Are you saying that men don't have the choice? In a lot of ways, we have fewer choices, actually. How? Yeah. Uh, see, every all the guys going. It's a side of the pants. Yeah, it's. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're supposed to do. And if you, if, if in the in the yeah. moment that you you suddenly yes, you, see. you you make some sort of choice that's against what society expects, suddenly you are less of a man. And, and that's also well, true. Diminished. That's also true for for you know for females as well. There's yeah. certain expectations, and there's there's pieces to that 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 count that you know counteract that. But but, but the sheer fact this bothers you. No, I, I was just trying to clarify. Uh, oh yeah. But, but if it does bother you, it proves the point. It actually does. That, that actually helps um, with I what... I was raised a bit differently than... Well, of, so obviously from your accent, uh, culturally, you have a, a different background. In Scandinavia. Scandinavia. Yes. I have no idea what people from Scandinavia are like. So, I know not these words, nor the, nor the culture. <laughs> we do have the gender imbalance, but less so. Less so. Yes. Well, in Europe, Europe has truly embraced uh, the fluidity of gender. Uh, Michel Foucault came out uh, in the early 70s, and his ideas of the fluidity of gender 
was truly embraced by Europe, and it's only been, it's only trickled down to the United States philosophically since about 2005. Yeah, since in academia, that's the first time it was taught here. It, it was, it, it, we felt, we felt it, but it's only, it, it traditionally, the way uh, uh, social movements work is that it comes out. And then as soon as academia embraces it, it takes 20 years to hit popular culture. Where we don't know why we think these thoughts now, we just do. <laughs> Our academia only embraced it in the mid-2000s. We knew of it, but still the, uh, the concepts before uh, uh, the ideas of modernity as opposed to post-modernity were embraced. So post-modernity, uh, the more French philosophers, all the people that are, uh, honestly, the side effects of the French Revolution didn't really hit here until probably about eight or nine years ago. I'm from California, so I'd say 20. <laughs> well, California is Europe. I mean, it, it, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> cult, cult, culturally, if you, you throw in California, yet again, the exception to the rule. But in, in the area, yeah, yeah, but in like, uh, in, in a rural town in Kansas, if, if you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? Actually, the language skills prove uh, your point. Um, we talked about Tim being more reserved in talking, mm -hmm. and uh, there is multiple studies showing that the female using twice as many words during the day than male. Um, and it's because male tend to act and female tend to discuss or think about it first, discuss you, in the group. You actually brought up an interesting uh, point as well. Um, this originally came from a fellow who, he was a Jewish historian, and he translated the Old Testament, and he came up with an interesting way to view God. The God, the way to view God was, I. It, uh, I, it, and I, thou. Man, when approached spoke to another, it was I, it, and there was I, thou, which was speaking to God. I, it, was to relay information and to convey data. I, thou, was to build relationship with the Lord. In uh, around 1994, a philosopher named Deborah Tannen related that to gender. She created two, uh, two different fields called re report talk and rapport talk. According to this theory, men speak to relay information. I say, how are you doing today? I am doing well. We didn't mean anything else by that. According to this theory, Deborah Tannen states that women speak to build rapport. The reason they spoke was not just to convey the data, but to build the relationship. And therefore, they would require more words. Also, that's why men and women don't always understand each other. When a man says something and a woman hears something else and the man's confused, that's because the communication was designed so that the, uh, a rapport was built. That's why she said, like, what do you mean by that? I'm like, I just meant I'm really hungry. And she thought, well, did you not like what you ate earlier? No, I meant that I'm really hungry. You didn't notice my hair? I just did it. I worked yeah. on it for two hours. And you're yeah. talking about how hungry you are? <laughs> so that's rapport versus rapport talk. Um, Sam Carter on the show uses rapport talk with her male peers while... Um, you can see other characters. Uh, what's an example of a female on the show that uses rapport talk? Can you think of one? Because it's very rare on Stargate, actually. Fraser. Fraser does from time to time. Uh, also, but occasionally yeah. Hammond. Yeah. That, Hammond, Hammond does was, use rapport talk. That's because it's a management skill. Mm -hmm. It's a brilliant management skill be, because if you can build a relationship with those who work mm -hmm. under you, you have a better relationship, they will do what you ask them to do. If you only say, do this now, and you don't ask them about their day, you'll never build a relationship, and they'll never truly respect you as well as do what you say. So that's actually a management skill. I mean, sending the... Vala? Vala is report talk. <laughs> that's yeah. a beautiful example. She is 
the other end of the spectrum. She is the non tunk okay. in that regard. Yeah, she is a fighter. She's very strong. But in the sense of a, a community of style, she is the non tilk That was brilliant, yes. So that's why she was a wonderful contrast on the show. While uh, uh, Tala, or Taylor, I can't remember how to say her name. Taylor. 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 She was a, like a Sam's Choice tunk. Like, <laughs> like, it, like the show couldn't afford like another tilk so... They, they went and got the one that kind of has the weird aftertaste. That, that's what she is, in, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I don't like the character at all. It, <laughs> it's, it's, ter it's a terrible character. The cam writer. I, I'm sorry, the great actress of the show. I don't know what they were thinking. Well, I think if you were talking about Taylor and Logan, it'd be, she'd almost kind of be in this wishy-washy middle of our big spectrum of things. It's I think like she goes like right, one, one, right one, from one episode to another. Exactly. She's a different person from one episode to the next. I mean, she either goes all the way one way for one episode, and then like the next episode, it'll be the other way. They're trying to figure out where, where she fits. It's like, it's like it is, it's like it's a switch. You know, it's, it's just not all one way or the other. It's just that sort of thing. She just keeps changing. Uh, Something else, let's go on the idea of a knight. Because for one thing, it's fun to talk about knights. What else does a knight have? A knight has honor. What else does he have? He has his sword. A great sword that shoots like. Well, exactly. To be a man on Stargate, or to be perceived as masculine, you have to have a weapon. That's why I asked to name this panel the staff weapon. Because quite literally, no one is truly respected in the martial sense until they pick up a gun. Sam Carter isn't their equal until she picks up a gun. Daniel Jackson had to pick up a gun. You had to pick up your sword or else you weren't a knight. What do you, how do you feel about this? And I know you always have an opinion, so say it. No, okay, like he's, oh, he's contemplating his what, words, what, and there will be many. What that makes me think about is, I mean, and a lot of people dislike the episode, but Emancipation, which is that third episode where um, she, uh, Sam Carter is taken as property by yes. the feudal lords, yes. and she has to prove, she actually tricks them into allowing them to, allowing them for her to prove herself. Mm -hmm. And the way she proves herself is how? She picks up a weapon, and she bests the strong warrior mm -hmm. in, in his own game. And by doing that, she gains some kind of respect. A lot of people don't like the writing of that episode, whatever. But um, I think for its time, I think it captured kind of where we were and was making a really bold statement about who Sam was going to be. There's a weird thing with uh, Stargate in the early days is, I don't want to poo-poo on the series, but it, it was the mid-90s. There was a lot of sci-fi on TV. We took what we could get. Mm -hmm. Like, it wasn't super well-written the first two, few seasons. On the other hand, most of us had like basic cable, it was bad, well, and, and, and Stargate was on, it was like, it has space weapons and aliens, I'm, I'll take it. Well, and I, so the first few seasons, they're rough, but I didn't care. I needed sci-fi. So the fact they're rough episodes, like, who cares, man? They, it's got a laser gun, that, that dude's from space, and I'm going to take this show. For, for me, I think, and what I noticed about mid-90s sci-fi and the shows that started around then, is the sci-fi before that, at least in, in my opinion, was a lot more like a periodical and it didn't matter, there was no continuity from one episode to the yeah. next. Yeah. And we're experimenting with a new kind of, of television mm -hmm. where we're going to develop and hash out characters and you get to remember things from previous episodes about, oh, do you remember when she did this? Remember when he did that? And, and it matters. Mm -hmm. If you watch Star Trek The Next Generation, which started in the 80s, you can watch an episode just standalone, and it's fantastic. You don't need to know anything else about the characters. I mean, you can get a really good idea. But with Stargate, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and you look at some of those shows. I don't know, Buffy, I think, broke the mold. Oh, yeah, sure. I think Buffy helped herald it in the new era. Exactly, yeah. And I'm talking, I'm talking, those, those things were, I mean, Joss Whedon did not struggle. That, that was something that, that yeah. series was brilliant for what it did. But Stargate was a sci-fi show that was experimenting with the arc writing. Well, uh, there's a, a conversation over here, so let's hear what this young lady has to say. I just wanted to say the episode that you're describing, when she was taking out the property, yes. is actually one of my favorites because it establishes her as she's not going to be the typical female character. That yes, see, I, I love it for that reason, too. Yeah. Yeah. Like, but many okay, people have attacked that episode I, I didn't for different reasons. It when it came out, I watched it just a few years ago for the first time. And I was like, okay, yay, sci-fi. Yay, another one girl in a team. Oh, she's actually not going to be just the girly girl. She's not going to repeat what the computer says. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but 
Yeah. As much as it, it is fun to say it, these are cliche gender roles, they're easy to watch. Mm -hmm. And here's the problem, is that Stargate Universe, for its strength and its weaknesses, if you came out on episode 8 and you've never seen this show, it doesn't make any sense. Yes, because all the characters are defying all their roles. You don't know what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. We need some stereotypes as a populace in general. Yes, we're all profound in this room, and we don't need all of that. Most people do. The show needed, it needed aliens, which we didn't get until much later. They, they were wandering around, confused and kind of being jerks to each other in a spaceship, and no one had a easily identifiable role. And it was just like, wow, this is the boring bickering show on a spaceship. <laughs> but, but in my opinion, if they immediately introduced an alien, and they all had a common foe, immediately, oh, yes. it would have been great. And, uh, and if some of the characters were like, this is the man's man, she is a, like, this is, this is the space loose girl, this is the space strong girl. This guy is the guy who reads books. This is the, this guy. Is the alpha that sleeps this around. This is the alpha that sleeps around. <laughs> it's as cliche as it is, you can grasp it really quickly. And it's a 45 minute show. So I think that's what hurt Universe and why the other two shows were on so long. Because you could immediately watch Atlantis and SG-1 and get it. Universe... Yes, it was a really good show. It was so cerebral, I think it defeated itself by trying to not be the other shows. What happened to it, man? Well, it, I like the Atlantis a lot, actually. There was no movement at all. There was no action. Even if, if there hadn't been aliens, the face was, like, numbing. Well, because they were trying so hard not to be the other shows. Sure. And, and they just, they got too profound for their own good. Everybody couldn't get their, uh, their head out of their textbooks. And 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 stop being profound. It it was just like they they wrote the show just so they could say that they wrote it, as opposed to trying to entertain us. I love all the actors. It went somewhere fantastic. It was amazing at, in the last part of the second season. It's like oh, it's a show finally. But they did things they didn't need to do, like like exploring sexuality with the stones. Like are they cheating? Are they not? Why did you do that? Like, this is a show that was already struggling, and now you're going to throw in possible giant controversy, and it's not the kind that helps with ratings. It's awkward, and then you watch it with your family, you're like, it's weird, I'm watching it with mom. Yeah, that's, that's not... It, it so defies the rubric of the honor and, 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 and uh, principal rubric to the point where it failed. That's my opinion, why the show failed, is they, they needed some stereotypes. Well, and the other thing was, in addition to the internal conflict yes. of That's all... Yes, why I hate Lord of the Rings. There's no hot chicks. Sorry. I just hate those movies. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> that was a... Uh, like, oh, it's got Liv Tyler. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was going to say, in addition to that, on, on Universe, what, what made it fail for me in a lot of ways was that external conflicts were almost solved. There were too many of them, and they were solved almost too easily. Like, they flew through a sun. They flew through a sun. How can anything be threatening to you after you fly through a freaking sun? How can you be scared of anything? Well, uh, well plus, like, who was, like, uh, I wanted to punch every guy in the face in that show. I'm sorry. Every guy. If they were around me, I was like, like, act right. Like, stop it. And oh, like, the only one, the, the villainish guy who found his magic cockpit. I'm like, well, at least you're kind of being cool. No, no, <laughs> go be Rumpel still skin. Like, like, <laughs> stop it. So that's why I thought the show didn't do well. Is that all those stereotypes you love to badmouth SG One Atlantis for? Save the shows. And people need people need anchors. Well, the problem, people say, like, don't stereotype. Stereotypes are bad. We all stereotype. We have to. It's fine if they're on the surface, but if, 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 like you say, when you just turn on the show and, and then you can, oh, yeah, this is the person, and then they go a bit under them. Like, if you yeah, just sure. turn on the show, yes, someone says, Beaker. Yeah. You need somebody but to root for. That's, that's yeah. More that fun if they actually have a bit more under the. People under need the time. Just, 
and what and audiences need rapport with the characters yeah. before yeah. you start delving into yes. being profound and yeah. getting into gender roles and altering your perspective about and having your mind go okay that can't happen until you know who you're talking to or know who you're watching yeah. plus it, it's, yeah. it's, it's it was what did it in 2011 was it 2011 yeah 2011 yeah haven't we had defying gender roles shoved down our throats enough by now I'm like how many times can i like okay i get it like Gender's fluid. Stop it. Just give me a sci-fi show with aliens and a laser gun. That's what I turned on the TV for. Like, sh that's why Sharknado worked. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, it was terrible, but I watched it. You know, I just had sharks and a tornado. And I could, I, like, I knew what I was walking into. I didn't turn on Sharknado, and then all of a sudden I had to, like, rethink all my uh, preconceptions on gender and wonder whether or not that man really is a woman because he thinks that he's a woman. Like, I didn't have to deal with that. There's a shark and a tornado. Like, like that, like, we've had so many years where, like, every Academy Award was for all these films that just blew our minds. Like, my mind has been blown. Stop it. Like, just let's go on. Like, the crying game was amazing. I get it. Make something else. Like, yeah, like, go back and tell me a story. Like, why not have one of the main characters and just be a transgender character? Yeah. Instead of having just one episode of it, it's like, okay, this is just the character, he's doing other stuff. And by the way. Well, that's actually a wonderful, incredibly appropriate postmodern way to do that. Just, I, I don't want to take it off the show, but Doctor Who in the first four years made homosexuality an issue by not making it an issue. They had homosexual and pansexual characters, and they didn't talk about it. It just was. And they moved on. Mm -hmm. Instead of throwing it down our face like, isn't it amazing that he's so strong and he can get through life doing like, yeah, now, now that you've pointed it out over and over again and beaten me in the head with it, am I supposed to feel deep now? No. But if it was just a character that I grew to love, this was a strong, good human being that I cared about, that's a better way to approach issues in my opinion. So going with all of that, let's look at the Kirk characters. Every show has a Kirk character, which is an odd take on chivalry. Because, yes, it's chivalry, but it's got an odd twist of honor. He has honor, but he can't keep his thing in his pants. He's got like a million kids. And we, we can't, as a populace, 85% of us just love it. Like, we love to have that guy. Like, as much as you love to hate them or you want to be them, you love to have the Hank Moody. Or you swear shows. that you don't admire that character. Yeah, like, he's horrible. God, he's awesome. horrible. All he does is he sleeps with one alien after another. And man, I wish that was him. Yeah. You know that sort of thing. Yeah, that's, <laughs> it's, that's why it's, it's not relatable. It's, it's yeah. a like, man, that's a superhero there. <laughs> well, who was our Kirk character on SG-1? Who did we have? O'Neill originally. O'Neill. And then who did it become uh, eventually? Daniel Daniel Jackson, yeah. What's interesting with Daniel Jackson is they started out with a traditionally more, I guess, feminine sexuality. Mm -hmm. Then they had him apparently take human growth hormone and cut all of his hair off. <laughs> and, 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 and then he became super male and, and then fought in the next Rocky. I mean, the guy became as butch as a kid's like, yeah, I know a lot about science. Ah, you've angered at me and exposed me to green radiation. I, well, because you can only stand so long. If the whole show is like, don't hate me, I'm reading Latin. Like, you're trying to be crazy. <laughs> like, Ipse, Ipse, that's the language of the ancients. Look at my long nogs. It would drive you crazy for 10 years. I love that, Daniel Jackson. You love that, Daniel Jackson. But as a whole, eventually you're like, pick up a weapon and punch somebody in the face. And like, I ascended. You know what I did when I came back? I punched someone. You know why? Because I ascended. And, and then he ascended, and he, when he came back, as he, as he ascended, he was like, I'm so deep. I'm so deep. I'm going to try to kill Anubis. I'm going to try to Oh, I can't. Because he, he wasn't that, that feminine gender role anymore. And it was a great idea to start with, but 
obviously the ratings didn't like it. So they tr they tried to make him the character from the movie. There's only so much of you that you can take until you're like, stop it. Yeah, like like Teal can't be the only man on this show. You know, like I know Emil very manly, but he was he was a Kirk comic relief type. We needed for an action show another warrior. Think of it as a D and D game. Think of it like that. We have uh, we have. Daniel's the cleric. Yes. Well, well, Daniel. <laughs> well, Derek. Uh, well, he was a. Uh, a the wizard. Yeah, he was more of a wizard. Of a Daniel wizard. Jackson was a wizard, and and we had Teal, who was uh, a a noble warrior. We had uh, Sam Carter, the Red Mage. Was Sam Carter? Yeah, I would say a, yeah. a mage. Yeah, and we had O'Neill. That I actually would say a paladin. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, he was a paladin. Well, eventually, when you play D and D long enough, your wizard keeps getting killed <laughs> because there's only so many times you can shoot magic missiles and with only three hit points until you're like, "Wow, you're really powerful." You stay over there. Way back. Yeah. So. Not the face. What, not the face. Yeah. So they had to multi-class him. So they had to give him like, "All right, um, you're a really high-level wizard." But we're going to have to multi-class you for a couple of rounds, and we're going to have to give you some skills and fighter. So they did, and all of a sudden, the entire class was able to then to defeat, you know, the, the party of um, beholders. But even if it's incorrect, not that it's like, okay, you know that people are writing it for him, and you know that it's like theory or something. Even if it's like, okay, there's a geek joining a military squad. He has to perform physically. Yes. He has to learn the weapons, or he is going to die. He's going to be a little Yeah, exactly. He was he was the so wizard that has three hit points. Yeah. A character that no matter how geeky you are, you have to adjust to the environment. And he did, thank God. Mm -hmm. If he was still that weak, like, like like we make the joke, how many times can Daniel Jackson die? He would die a lot more a lot. if he mm -hmm. didn't learn how to fight. Right. Yeah. yeah. And we didn't see it, but I think we saw a little bit. But, but gosh, in my head. Would it be just awesome if, like, every episode, Teal goes, Daniel, it's time to go back and spar. <laughs> that would be so awesome! Because, like, in the Avengers comics, like, Captain America always is yelling at Tony Stark, saying, like, Tony, you know, eventually you're going to be out of the armor. We need to spar. So they start sparring constantly so that Tony Stark learns how to fight. Well, like, he might be a philanthropist, a billionaire, playboy, but the armor, run, like, it runs out of batteries. Eventually, you got to charge him. So someone might, he might need to punch somebody in the face. Well, Daniel Jackson, uh, there's only so many times you can read Gaelic, and eventually you need, you need to be able to run real fast and jump and punch. What kind of archaeologist carries a gun? I do. Bad example. Okay, that is the sort of thing. He also kept his geeky setting. He kept reading the ancient language. Yes, yes, he did not stop that. It's yeah. about, oh, we can't do this. We're interfering too much, so we have to be kind. That but he was yeah. multi-classing. He was multi-classing, yeah. yeah. So, he, despite the fact we started out with him with this fluid gender sexuality, like, you're going to die. You, <laughs> you, you, like, so, in my, my theory is that Teal, because Teal, SG-1 did a wonderful thing without embracing romance. They did something awesome. They embraced guys when they have a friendship. It's like this love that means more than a lot of your family. These are the... They, you would die for these men, and you love them. You hug them, and you don't you don't effing care. And it's super brotherly. Super love. brother. Like yeah. people call it bro love to mock it. It whatever. It's it's a it's real, real true relationship that guys will develop, and you can't put it into words. And like if you make gay jokes about it, we're like whatever. Like you don't understand. SG what did that really well, mm -hmm. and with that kind of uh, love and admiration for each other. I could totally see Tilk say, Daniel, I have to do this. If I don't teach you how to protect yourself, I have failed as your friend. So th wouldn't that be a great episode if he said, like, we have to stop what we're doing. We need to start going in this room. I'm going to hand you a staff, and we're going to fight. I would have loved an episode of him doing it and Daniel fighting him over. Like, I don't need to do this. Like, I'm doing this because I truly care. Actually, in the books, um, it said that O'Neill who is doing that. And uh, there is a book, uh, Four Dragons, Okay. Um, where Daniel just got uh, back from his ascension, first ascension. And then Neil recognized that he needed to teach him how to fight. So 
Jackson still have this lost memory and he recovers yeah. from lost memory and that's how Neil embeds in him this ability to fight. I mean there is a whole chapter there where it's just a Neil's thoughts on that and um, um, how 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 he pushing Jackson constantly to, to learn how to shoot, to learn how to fist fight, to do to do these things. And it's exactly saying the same thing. You you can be we can protect you for so long. At some point, you will be alone in the wilderness, and somebody will attack you. Is this what you were talking about, that book? Or are you talking about a specific episode? What episode? Oh, God, I don't remember. I, know, I can't remember episode names. Like, you know the one with the Stargate? <laughs> <laughs> I remember that one. That was a really good one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it hit a bear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, well, well come, try to come up with it or describe it. Okay. And then uh, what I'm going to say is that I think Tilk actually got multi-class there in the last two or three seasons. He was a priest. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because he was the wizened sage. He had seen and gone through all this and observed all this. And one particular scene that comes to mind is in, uh, I want to say it's in season 10, where he has a conversation with Toman, who has made the turn. He is no longer following the path of the Ori. And, and Toman says, how do you get over? To having killed all these innocent people. And he goes, forget about it, you never will. And they have that conversation, and he says, I did it for decades. I was the first prime of Apophis, and I did these terrible things, and I wonder how many good deeds I'll have to do to be able to make up for it, and I will never do enough. And you just need to face it right now. That is your path now. And I was like, I was always impressed, like, Tilk as counselor. How he like hey, took on that new role because before he was the one who had to be counseled. He had Braytac, you know, that was counseling him through that that building. What what is honor and what what is what, what are your values and what's more important here in I, this moment? I think this show so embraces the the traditional masculine trait of honor. I think that's why it, it, the show makes us feel ennobled. We watch it and. It, it's a good thing to watch. It's actually a moral show to watch because it reminds us of real honor. Does anybody agree or disagree? I agree. Can I just why you would choose to go with the knight archetype versus, say, a samurai? Sort of a Ronin samurai. You know, because it's Eastern. Eastern philosophies are so different that uh, it, 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 that's, that's opening up another can of worms. And considering that we are Americans, most of us, except for you, <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, we have our basis in, in, uh, in British culture. Uh, that's why I did that. If it was just taking place in, um, in Tokyo or, or uh, uh, somewhere else, I would choose an Eastern. If it was just taking place in Bangladesh, uh, I may choose a, a, a different uh, char a character to base this upon. But we are sitting in uh, a colony uh, a British colony. They landed nearby. We're all pretty much connected to that culturally. So that's why. That's why I didn't choose a uh, 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 someone from uh, the kingdom of Lesotho. I have a very good friend named Tabisu uh, from there, and he and I never understand each other culturally. Uh, it's really interesting when we talk. It doesn't. It, like, it's brilliant because we'll say things and we have nothing culturally in common. And I met him in Ireland when I worked in a hostel about 10 years ago. When we talk, his view of the world is so different than mine. It's, it's wonderful to talk to him about current events because I, ne I could not ever, well, I could, but it would just be so hard to come to the conclusions of the way he views the world because I am who I am and he is who he is. So therefore, I chose the knight because it is ingrained into who I am and in the large preponderance of us, the concept of knighthood. That's why I chose that as opposed to a samurai. Yes? And the show actually goes from the basis of a knight. If you look back to the original armor of the Jaffa, it's a full body, body armor suit with helmet, true samurai wore them as well. However, they serve a king and queen, the god and the goddess. The, they ride chariots. I mean, it is very much based on Ron Thurian, especially in the eighth season, uh, Thurian legend. Mm -hmm. But that was a very good question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, coming back to the everybody needs to have a 
shotgun to be muscular. I think again it's cultural um, because I am like at least historically I'm coming because I'm coming from Russian history and I mean I was in great that was in great mm -hmm. and uh, Scandinavian history. If you're looking at it, um, everybody at some point pick up an armor. I mean, in, in Scandinavian culture, it's shield maidens. Um, Russian. Are you a shield maiden? Yeah, we had. Uh, Not you specifically. No, I, no, well, I do fight, so, yeah, sir. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He tries to stop me. But... No, no, so I was like, heck yeah, man. That's awesome. And then, uh, by the way, I know. That's, that's great. Right. Um, yeah, like, someone's going to come and rob us. Take it, shield maiden. <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> um, in, in Russian culture, the, the, there's an old poem like, by a famous writer who said that the Russian woman is one who is, will stop the horse at, at, at race speed and will go in the burning uh, house. Like, like this is normal. I think it's again, it's very British, and it's Victorian even. It's 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 fairly new idea. Victorian were the the knight need to have like like only the knight can have the the sword, well, and if you pick up the sword, you are the knight. You are the chivalry, chival I'm sorry, chivalrous, chivalrous person. Actually, uh, that's from the High Middle Ages, yeah. around ten, uh, around uh, one thousand fifty, actually. Um, yeah, it's what. But yeah. Russia has also lots of old fairy tales where the hero is actually the female. Yeah. Zeke also great quest to save the man. So it's it's traditionally women in the northern area of Europe have been very strong. Plus countries. historically Russia was also uh, a part of the Roman Empire and uh, that, that it was if you follow uh, the split of the They East. stopped on the, on the, on the, on the, at the okay now you're getting something which I know very well. They stopped okay, in the territory where I so. lived in. Uh, they stopped in the territory where I lived in. I lived in Moldova, which is not Russia. It's okay. like a separate country of Soviet Union, part of the Soviet Union. They stopped with a um, Tracian. Did their culture stop there? Yes, very much. Russia have nothing to do with the Romans. Even the religion. This is why even the religion was not adopted as a Latin religion, but as our. What's a czar? Tsar is a Caesar. It's <laughs> coming from the Greek Caesar, Greek Greek Caesar uh, from the Byzantine Empire, which is where the Byzantines. Byzantines had more influence from the Greeks. Where do they than come from? Roman. Byzantines have. It's whenever the Roman Empire Greek split into. Roman. It's it's whenever the Roman Empire split into under the age of Diocletian. Yes, but but the Greek, but they had the influence. Sorry, I, I've studied a lot. <laughs> yeah, but they were had more Greek influence. They even even the language Fresh, the of the Byzantine, of the Byzantine, uh, were, 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 were more Greek, Hellenic oriented. Okay, um, that's why you can. So, so were the Romans because yeah. they basically took everything from the Greeks no, and plagiarized it, put new names on it. They yeah, plagiarized it. The Greeks embraced it because it was the power base. Yeah, but but um, um, well, Again, the, the, I the only, the, only the, people you can make this uh, argument for are the people in the Near East. Uh, Russia had a ton of cultural influence from the Roman Empire. They simply did. I'm sorry. Uh, from Byzantine, like, maybe. But this yes. Is like, uh, it's, it's, okay. It's, you, you, thank you for proving my point. So, uh, moving on. Yeah, question. I just wanted to get back to the whole Daniel Jackson. And I'm just wondering, in the beginning, Samantha Carter was very traditionally masculine. And I think as, and Daniel Jackson was much more feminine. And in my mind, they kind of flip-flopped as the series went on. And she became more feminine and prettied up and makeup and more of that kind of stuff and was put more into that role as Daniel became more masculine. And I wonder if it isn't like some sort of a balance that they were trying to kind of paint. Go more into that, that's good. No, 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 give examples from the show. That's, that's really good. Because everything needs balance. That was brilliant. Tell me more. I don't know what more to say. Like, yes. <laughs> they have a few episodes where Sam and Hala go shopping. Or they're coming from a shopping trip. Right. Dressing, and they're in dresses. dresses and, and, yeah, exactly. So they're moved. Well, if you look at a rich. Switch between Daniel and 
Sam, and also because Vala came in, and then Sam starts to be a little bit more girly because he has someone to connect with. Right. I got that feeling. Oh, yeah. But I didn't dislike that. Uh, uh, no, yeah, it, was, it was nice. Well, I, I remember, if you go back to Emancipation, when she found it so disgusting oh to be wearing God. an absolutely yeah. beautiful oh, okay. dress. Yeah. Also, what, what year did that come out with, when she was wearing the dress and she was being pretty? No, well, oh, Emancipation was 97. No, no, when, when, when's the episode when she got girlier and started going to the What about 2005? 2005, a different time period. Yeah. Second wave feminism was still happening uh, when it started. The third wave, when women can do whatever they want and still be feminine, was in that episode aired. She was an example of the culture. How much of it do you think was st shows like Stargate and pop culture? Contributing to that third wave, though, by showing them you can be masculine and feminine and still be what you want to be, you can do anything. Actually, uh, the uh, the feminine philosophers actually they had a hard time because originally third wave feminism, believe it or not, was called Buffy studies uh -huh. because Buffy yeah. the Vampire Slayer culturally had such an impact on the entire culture that mm -hmm. she was both feminine and masculine. While she was a fighter, yet she was a, a at times a weak and scared woman, but she didn't matter. She was still incredibly feminine. Not only was it okay, it, it was actually encouraged it, in the other. It, it was a strength. Okay. So that event, that was one of the, quite ironically, is what led to the idea of third wave feminism was literally Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Right. And they had a hard time as a, uh, an academic community stop saying that because everyone knew it was right, but it was Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So the fact that Buffy was a contemporary of it, you could really say that we could we thank Joss Whedon a lot for that mm -hmm. culturally. Oh yeah, yeah. Is that well, he he, uh, he was so, so good at writing that that fluid dynamic female characters. That you know, it allowed the writers of Stargate to know it's okay to write that. Mm -hmm. But was it just okay to write it, or is it possible that they were all in the same wave? Yeah, Joss Whedon kind of led the charge, but I don't think it was him giving the key to the gateway. I think he was the pebble in the pond. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's yeah, kind of agree. I think he, he was he threw the stone and the ripples began. Yeah, but there's a whole lot of uh, post-feminist backlash yeah. around that time period. That's, uh, uh, when are you talking about in academia? Because I, um, late 80s, early 90s, again, California. Yeah, so, that know. backlash really <laughs> led to the uh, third wave. It, yeah. it truly did. Yeah. And uh, who, who was it? Like Samantha Beauvoir, who, who, who really approached yeah. that? Uh, what did you teach in university? Oh, I didn't teach. What, what did you study? Everything. Everything? <laughs> So, I was Daniel Jackson. So you're Daniel Jackson, <laughs> which is a brilliant thing to be. Mm -hmm. well, how much time do we have left? We're running close. We're running close. This has been a good panel. Has everybody enjoyed? Yes. Yeah. And Ken's in here for the next hour as well on a different topic, but since the next panel is yours, if you want to go 10 minutes or whatever, if y'all are still on the a discussion. Yeah, we'll, we'll still discuss. The next panel is called uh, Your God is an Alien. So we're discussing what happens to religion whenever it becomes a a mythos in fiction. Um, if you need something, I can run and get it. Otherwise, you can roll one into the next if you're on a... Does it start immediately? No, it starts no, in half an hour. About half an hour. So this gap, we don't really so need it. It starts at one? Yeah. OK, so I'll, I'll go on for another nine minutes and then take a break. OK. That's, I'm going to let you make that call. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's take questions. Who has a, a idea, concept, uh, anything they want to say about um, masculinity, yeah, which always brings up femininity in Stargate? Who has any questions or comments or concerns or, or uh, wants to share a story about their childhood in which they met a panda bear? I don't know. Panda bears are awesome, man. What makes you want to do this panel? Talk about this. Which started? Back in college, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, like every collegian. And I started out as pre med, because that's what you always do. And then. 
and then I, I kind of bounced around, and then I started, I dated one of the presidents of the National Organization of Women, which was really hot. Oh my God, wow. And then I accidentally dated another, the, the next president of the National Organization of Women without knowing, and I was like, feminists are gorgeous and hot and smart, so I take it, started taking all these women's studies courses, and like, I'm really enjoying this. And then I found out, like, I can take a degree in this? So I found out that there's a, a field called interpersonal communication, and I could, I could specialize in dating. And like, I love dating. So I wrote, <laughs> I wrote my thesis on, on dating. I'm like, this is the best thing ever. So my other major was uh, classics, Roman history. So, and in Roman history, I'm like, well, I know a bunch of gender theory, so I started studying masculinity and femininity in the ancient world. And then um, when I went on to grad school, the two programs were fighting over me, and I chose uh, uh, ancient. And I was teaching for about, I was in grad school for uh, a year, then I, and I was in grad school and taught for uh, another year, and I realized that I was reading 2,000 pages a week, um, I was gaining a ton of weight, I was depressed, I hated my own life, and I stopped. And I left graduate school, I didn't finish. I had one more semester left, just I was beyond, unha beyond unhappy. And I left academia completely. Um, I'm a musician by trade. I stopped playing music for three years. I took back up guitar. I went back to our, my family business where I was my own boss. And I was happy again. And then around whenever I started uh, my, my band, which is a Doctor Who band, uh, they asked me to be on some panels, and I was like, I've never been on a panel before, but I can talk, and and I have this huge background, which apparently nobody does, is that I know a ton about sci-fi, and I really know about gender, so whenever there are pe people present me with, like, what panels do you want to lead, and like, I only give gender themes things, well, generally, because that's what I know how to talk about. I'm a geek who can talk about gender. And uh, it's, it's also interesting because generally it's from a uh, alternative sexuality lens at, at the conventions. Uh, uh, I, I've been told several times it's very odd that I'm a heterosexual male and I want to talk on this. And it's because like I have no idea why every man doesn't want to talk about this. This, this, this is brilliant. This is a really interesting field. Well, so that's why at, at almost every con I attend, I end up leading like 10 panels like this because I can and I'm some weird aberration. I shouldn't be here, so they keep asking me to do it. Well, what makes them a rare commodity is, I don't know, you know, we, we surf the internet and we form groups and we want to chat and sometimes the, the chat goes this direction. And there are plenty of armchair gender theorists out there. But this guy has some actual credentials. And that's why whenever we said, hey, but you know about this stuff, plus we like you and you're a fun guy, how about you come and talk about what you're great at and entertain us and help us understand what we love, which is Stargate. We have that in common. I mean, this is, this is fantastic. I'm so, like, it's actually the bridge track originally had me completely, and Jennifer said, it, it was a mate, she's the track director, said, I'll let you talk about it, whatever you want. And I said, Okay, so I presented like four or five panels, and she said yes to all of them. Like, well, Brick Track, you're going to have to share me because they're giving me free reign to talk about exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> and there's a couple other tracks that were fighting over me, like Jennifer got there first. I'm sorry. So, <laughs> she, she did. And how? So I actually brought in as a Doctor Who guest, but uh, since Stargate is so incredibly cordial, and y'all are a, always a wonderful audience, I'm over here four times this weekend out of my. 11 or 12 appearances just because um, you're allowing me to talk about my my other passion, which plus is... The, uh, plus the charity event, right? Plus, I, um, she was nice enough to ask my band to play for the Stargate charity event. So... Next year. And apparently I'm playing it next year. <laughs> <laughs> our, our main... My schedule's in in February. I beat everybody to it. So, yeah. so, so that, that's why I did this that's panel, just because it's... Well, we do. It's what I like to talk about, and it's honestly there's I don't, other than my old friends from grad school, there's no one to talk to about this. Well, I mean, as 
Jennifer and I do programming for this track. I mean, that's a big part of it. We do uh, Facebook and that sort of thing, and we ask fans, what is it that you want? And they, they give us some topics, and we're like, who wants to leave a panel on it? And then all of a sudden, crickets. Yeah, and and also, people don't want necessarily want to come to panels where the only people that are on the panel are people who are the loudest on the internet forum. Yes. You know, because that's not always the most valuable opinion. It's also not the most credentialed opinion out there. And anytime we hear somebody say, "I would like archaeology as a panel," and I'm an archaeologist. Yes, yeah, Scott. Well, hey, Scott. Scott, you now have three panels this weekend. Yeah, my okay. band's manager is also on this track, and he's an archaeologist. So, if you've seen Scott Begay, uh, yeah, he's another from our coven. And, and we just debuted the first alcohol and sci-fi panel this year. Yeah. And we're through on coven. So. Mm -hmm. so, if you really enjoy, I have cards. You can follow us. Follow me on Facebook. I, um, I say words in there many. A few years ago, we had a guest, and it just kind of just kind of happened. and said, uh, "Yeah, I like mythology, and I love Stargate, and I would love to do a panel on the Asgard." We're like, go. And he came in here with PowerPoint, he and had, I mean, it was, it was. He's a universe.